Hey, what's going on, Hospitality MD listeners? It's Kyle back with another episode of our podcast interview series presented right here on YouTube. Before we get started, you know the drill. Be sure to subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications on this channel, like this video, comment on this video, and uh, share this video. Uh, today's interview is with the one and only Glenn Hausman, who hosts No Vacancy Live, No Vacancy News. Links to all of his information are at the top of today's description. So we're talking about Glenn's Annunciation moment, how a man with no hotel experience has become one of the foremost leaders in the industry, interviews the top CEOs of management companies and brands, and how his mission to educate, inspire, and entertain guides him every single day and has allowed him to overcome the self-esteem and anxiety issues that he had uh, in his, his early life. So tune in, enjoy, and we'll see you at the end of the video. Welcome back to another episode of Hospitality MD. Today, Glenn Hausman is joining us uh, from No Vacancy News, No Vacancy Live. Welcome to the show. How are you, my friend? Uh, great, but I'm a little sad for you, Kyle. I mean, you have such a great show, and now you're ruining your reputation by having me on. <laughs> I apologize to all the listeners in advance. Uh, <laughs> you should. <laughs> I, I have some, uh, or actually Glenn has some dirt on me and this was a manipulation. This, we, we did not, this was not voluntary, but you That's guys right. don't need to know that. <laughs> you had no idea hospitality journalism was so dirty and filled with politics, but that's what we're going to share with you today. Yep. Just like the rest of it. <laughs> All right, Glenn. Um, so hospitality journalism, right? That's you. You basically, for the most part, you you dominate that space in terms of visibility and um, kind of reputation at this point, at least from from my perspective. And I'm sure others will share that as well. But the the thing for me is hospitality journalism, so unique, so niche. So what I want to know is your enunciation moment. Why hospitality? Why hotels? Take us back as long and as far back as you can remember yep. to that hospitality moment for you. Uh, yeah, well, the reason why I love this business so much, I actually, uh, Kyle, I actively sought to be in the hospitality industry. It was kind of accidental, kind of on purpose. But before I entered the hospitality sphere, I worked in uh, the music and entertainment industry. And I was just a real young kid. I mean, just out of college, working for one of those free giveaway magazines that they used to have at places that don't exist anymore, like Power Records and all of those kind of places. So that was a fun way to start off my career. But I found it very unsatisfying. While it was great to go and hang out with bands backstage, I live on Long Island, so we have the Jones Beach Amphitheater, and I got to do a lot of really cool stuff doing that. And we'd also go into the city and I'd interview celebrities and stuff like that. But the celebrity would come in and you'd kind of have this big room filled with journalists. Now this is going back to like 1994, 1995, before the internet was really the internet that we know of today. So it was very little bit different, but in a way, it was kind of the same. So we'd go to these amazing hotels, the celebrity would come in and you'd have 10 or 15 journalists around and the whole thing would just be a feedback loop about how amazing the celebrity is. So the celebrity would lie to us and tell us about what a difficult acting role this was and how incredible the crap film was that they were that they were promoting. And then all of the journalists that were over there were all like, uh, um, you're so amazing, you're so wonderful, how are you so wonderful and amazing? And that would really be about the whole line of questioning. So other than going to a hotel and seeing all of these great suites that I could not stay in and all of this amazing food that the celebrities are eating that I could not eat and getting some t-shirts with names of movie titles on them, that really didn't satisfy me as a, as a human being. And I realized kind of in that moment, what I wanted out of life was 
a lot more in regards to experiences. And I really wanted to be able to, when eventually my kids put me into an old age home, and I've been saying this before I even had kids, that I want to have great stories to be able to share before the dementia kicks in, in my rocking chair, telling all my friends. So I've tried to lead my life in that way. And that kind of brought me towards the hospitality industry because I love the hotel atmosphere. I love food and beverage. I love all of those types of things. So I made sure I got into it and I started in the hospitality business in 1996, I think it was. So was it these moments of going to the hotels with the celebrities and seeing that? Was that when your mind started going, like kind of trailing into like, I'm here with the celebrities, right. but I'm kind of picking up just, you know, that presence when you walk into a hotel, right. that, that vibe that you get, is that what was happening? You were already starting, those seeds were being planted subconsciously at the time and you didn't even know it. Yeah, Kyle, I agree, man. I think that's exactly what happened because I just love that atmosphere. And, and quite frankly, whenever I went to hotels as a kid, I always just loved it. I was fascinated by it. I don't think I ever put two and two together until many, many years later. But I think taking those summer road trips with my family and staying at the Holiday Inn and all of those types of brands that were really a part of our lives in the 1970s was something that um, really, I think, was embedded in me that came to the surface that helped me in some subconscious way to find my way to where I am today. Yeah, I, I mean... I agree with my mom being a flight attendant for so many years. Oh, it was just, awesome. that was, it was part of the lifestyle, not only just living hospitality in general. Cause you know, my mom would always say we had to do one random act of kindness per day. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was a translation from her hospitality career, but, um, but also just going on the plane, experiencing that kind of crescendo of, leaving your house early in the morning and like that anxiety of, are we going to, you know, are we going on the plane and then getting to the airport, going through that experience flying. And then that day crescendo when you kind of land and then crescendoing again to get back to the hotel um, where that, you know, you always tell yourself if we can just make it to the hotel, we'll be good. And that was always a special, <laughs> special thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. But not only that Kyle, but to me, it's exciting. It's, a, you're about to have an adventure. You're about to experience the unexpected. Even if you've been to 500 conferences like I have, there's still that moment whenever I check into a hotel, when I take out that key card and put it in the slot or wave it against those new, you know, those new devices that they have. It's, a, it's the most exciting minute to me of all of my trips because then I open up the room and all of a sudden I see what I'm going to have and the experiences that I think I'm going to have that lay ahead. In particular, if I'm in a fun environment like Las Vegas or something like that, that I know this is the beginning of a lot of fun and experiences that I'm going to have, even if I'm going to be working like crazy 24 hours a day. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's the, it's the backdrop to your entire experience. Yep. So have you ever worked in a hotel, Glenn? No. No, you've never worked in a hotel. So <laughs> has anybody ever told you what you're doing is not authentic because you've never worked in a hotel. I'm not saying I believe that. I'm just asking. Oh, right. No, hey, listen, <laughs> I believe that it's your job to be the devil's advocate here and to, you know, to cause trouble. So I get it, Doc. I get it. Um, but no, never, 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 never. I'm actually surprised that that hasn't happened. But the, the fact of the matter is I've spent, you know, I used to travel before COVID, 125, 150 nights a year in hotels. And while I never actually did some of the jobs in hotels, I think I got a very good understanding of how it works. Now, I'd probably be even better at my job had I put in a year or so in a hotel or even six months working behind the front desk, doing housekeeping, doing some other things. So I don't have, in some ways, that, con that context. And I definitely don't have those cool stories to be able to share with people. But I think the milieu that I've been hanging out in for the last 25 plus years of going from the, you know, the above the property level to the corporate executive level and stuff like that has informed me in a way that a lot of other folks just simply don't have access to. So uh, while I may not have the property level experience, I have a whole other world of insights that were that sometimes other people don't have. Well, I think, um, you know, we're going to drop a new show idea right now, which is that 
Glenn Hausman goes to hotels and works in line level positions for a day and the camera follows you around and you capture it. You get the stories, you get the, um, you know, you get a little bit of a, of a, of a notch in your belt, I guess. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of authentic. So let me know. That, we're that's actually do something I've wanted to do for years and years and years. And when I was working in my older jobs prior to starting No Vacancy and No Vacancy News and all of that, um, that's something I always intended on doing. And ever since I started this particular aspect of my career, I just haven't had the chance to be able to devote a day, two days. I think a week would be even better to be able to do that. And you're absolutely right, Kyle. It'd make for a great video series of me screwing absolutely everything. <laughs> Starts out with the hotel being so excited to welcome you. Right. Glenn, we're so glad you get to join us today. We are putting you in stewarding. You're yeah. going to be washing the, the pots and pans and making sure that our banquets and restaurants are, are have clean silverware and dishes to use. By the end of the night, it's them throwing you out and and uh, and saying, we, right. we had to give so many comps away because everybody's plates right. were dirty. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready for that. <laughs> and what I really want to do is I want to have like a TripAdvisor listing in the top right corner and you can see the hotel's position plummet throughout the day. <laughs> throwing things up. <laughs> a live uh, live count <laughs> yeah. uh, of, of seeing that position deteriorate over yeah. the day. Right. You know and, what? Uh, I love this. <laughs> every time I screw up. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> well, I'll be definitely looking forward to that show. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll have to help you put that one together because that's just that. that's just gold. That is just gold. OK, so like you mentioned, Glenn, you have the opportunity to meet so many different people, executives, uh, corporate yeah, we went from brands, management companies, uh, vendors all over the board in, in the industry. So you and, and you highlighted this. You have a unique perspective that not very many have. Um, and I think, you know, maybe one of the reasons why nobody has ever said to you, this isn't authentic, you've never worked in a hotel is because you really are helping people such as myself and such as others who, who have typically worked in on property, uh, middle management roles, or even entry level, and even GMs and regionals get access to information that they don't normally have access to get uh, an inside scoop on conversations that are relevant to their business, but that are in the C-suite that they will never have the doors right. open to at least for a decade or so. Uh, do you see your role in that? Like, is that part of your, your purpose? Um, yeah. uh, I have a mantra that I, okay. that everything I do has to um, educate, empower, and hopefully entertain right? So educate, empower, entertain. And by keeping to that, I think it keeps me really focused. It keeps me to um, really help people get to what their goals are. Plus, I'm super crazy, crazy passionate about the hotel business and food and beverage and all of hospitality. I find all that stuff incredibly fascinating. So I live it, I breathe it, but I also have a completely different perspective than people that have been raised throughout their entire careers in that business. So I kind of bring a little bit of an outsider's point of view alongside with the trust of being an insider at the same time. So I, help, I think it helps inform me to help educate people in a way that they might not necessarily see because we all have a tendency to, when we're so much in the thick of it, to not see things that are plainly evident to those on the outside. I actually, I just got chills when you mentioned that because I think you're absolutely right. And I, I never understood why you were so effective. That's why I'm like, somebody must've told you that you suck or something at one point for not working. Like uh, that's my entire I, childhood, by the way. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> okay. Oh shit. Bring up that childhood <laughs> trauma. Damn Listen, it, man. I still, <laughs> I'm still like, uh, come on, pick me for the kickball team, please, please. <laughs> You and me both, brother, you and me both. But but, <laughs> but you're right, Glenn, like this is the reason why and I never understood it because you don't have bias um, from either being jaded from working in the hotel industry, which can really kick your ass or uh, just simply by, by having, um, you know, so much knowledge, whether good or bad. And that's why I think, um, you know, you have such a good, like when you do your live shows with, with Anthony, it works out really well, that balance of um, Anthony, which is just 
bias, right? Because he spent his entire career in hotels and he has strong opinions on those things balanced with you, which is kind of more um, objective and kind of, you know, you bring that journalism side to it, but it's, and, but it's also like, help me understand, because if you can explain this to me, who's never been in hotels, that means that that um, housekeeping supervisor from, uh, you know, from Kansas will be able to kind of maybe understand this a little bit better because we're breaking down some of that jargon that, you know, these executives and Anthony or really anybody in, in the business can just go back and forth on like it's nothing because they know it, mm-hmm. but let's, let's educate, right? Let's yeah. educate. And I think it's, I think it's been super, super effective. Um, yeah. Kyle, I'll also add that the other important ingredient in all of this is curiosity. I say, if hmm. you are inherently curious in your life, and that leads you down the right path of success if you're doing a, a role such as mine. You know, as I was coming up, I would find everything about this business fascinating. Like I got excited about the fact that one day I learned that there are carpet squares. You don't have to replace the whole carpet if someone spills something, right? I mean, I, I get really excited about stuff like that because it's fun, it's interesting, I'm learning and I'm curious. And I think that curiosity thing helps me ask the questions of people that come from a place of um, innocence in a way that gets people to be open and honest with me to really share what their true insights are as opposed to feeling like um, they have to stick to the corporate line or something like that because they feel like they're being grilled. I just want to learn. I just want to have my audience learn along with me. So it's after multiple decades, right? Two plus decades now of, of doing the hotel specific journalism. You know, it sounds much worse when you say it, by the way. Let me just emphasize two plus <laughs> decades. Did you guys hear that? We're talking 20 plus years. Uh, 25 uh, at this point. Oh, God almighty, help me. Glenn has been doing this longer <laughs> than I have been alive, folks. Um, just just got to emphasize that. I don't know if that's awesome or really sad. I think it's oh, both. <laughs> it's great. It's awesome, man. <laughs> but you still have questions, right? You've been doing this for so long, but you still are are curious about things. You, you haven't learned at all. I think you may have actually said this in another interview that I heard, which was, ah, I know I'm going to butcher this, um, all right. but I, I think you said the more that you learn about this industry, the more you realize that you don't understand anything about this. Right. The, the more Something I, look, along those I lines. know is kind of like uh, that, that line, right? Because the more you learn, you realize there's so much more out there. And the reason why this business is so great, because it's not just uh, the business of hotels. It's broken down into so many different interesting categories. If I had wound up going to a pest control type of line of work, right? There's only so much you could talk about with that. But with the hospitality business, you have everything. It's, you know, customer service, it's real estate, it's food and beverage, it's, you know, it's um, the revenue management component, it's design, I can go on and on, technology, it's like literally every single business out there in one. So I get to play in all these different sandboxes all the time and build different communities of people in all of these different industry segments, and then kind of pull information from one area to the other that helps inform those other categories. And what's really interesting about that is the industry is a lot of ways is a lot of different vertical businesses that don't overlap. I mean, sure, people at the executive level, the CEO knows all of these things, but all of my designer friends, none of them know any of my technology friends because they're in Mm. two totally different worlds. The food and beverage people, They don't know the financial real estate people for the most part at all. So it's so cool that I can be in the middle to kind of take observations from all these different categories and then boil it down into a way that makes sense to the entire industry to give them perspective they may not have had because they're looking at things through a very specific lens where I have a whole array of point of view. First of all, um, waiting for the pest control people to say, wait a second, we have so much complex complexities in our business. They do, but they don't have like 50 <laughs> businesses in one. You know, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. 
<laughs> right, right, definitely. And then uh, alternatively, I guess it, it makes the what you just shared changes my perspective because here I thought that the entire time you are exclusively learning from the people you bring on to your show, from the people you talk to, but I can only imagine the um, the education that you provide to those people by being able to synthesize all those different points of view and uh, present it to uh, the subject that you're interviewing in a way that, again, their their narrow sphere of um, of focus wouldn't have typically allowed them access to um, maybe those thoughts uh, in the first place. Yeah, and one of the places you know beyond learning while I'm on air interviewing people, honestly, is being out on the road and having experiences and going to all these different events and all these different categories and going to all the cocktail events and the, uh, the parties and stuff like that and having real meaningful conversations about people with their point of view and the world and how they approach their business and the fundamental things that are important to their success for their careers and for their employment. So um, I can really learn a lot by being out and about as much as I have been locked in this house for over the last year. Sure. Do you think that your brain works differently um, and is has been trained to, to function differently than, than most, would you say? And I guess that's a very ambiguous question to a certain yeah. extent because yeah, everybody's brain works differently than most. So, but uh, I'll give you an ambiguous answer. Okay. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, I just... I just kind of approach it from my particular point of view. Everybody comes from a very specific upbringing and a worldview and all of that kind of stuff. So I don't think I'm any different in that sort of sense. But again, I think it comes back to I'm very fortunate that I was born incredibly curious and I love to learn. Yeah, yeah, because really where I was going with that is the synthesis, the ability that you have to synthesize information, I think is... Um, it's definitely a gift that you have and it's a strength that you possess um, that maybe not everybody else does. But then again, you can say that with many but gifts that others file, have that you, you don't you'll have. You'll get there if you don't feel you have that skill set set yet, right? You were just uh, you were just saying how much, you know, younger and sexier you are than me, because I'm, you know, AARP is stalking me these days. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is because I've been in the business or any business for that matter for so long. My skill set has improved over time because I really worked at it and put the effort in, understanding that tomorrow I won't be rewarded for it, but sometime in the future I'll be rewarded for it. And that's kind of like how I faced my entire career. Slowly, slowly building, 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 always trying to make this year better than last year, but hopefully it won't be as good as next year. So that's great. And that actually leads me to a segue because as we said, and I'm so sorry to emphasize this again, multiple decades doing this, right? And <laughs> I, so I, I love it. Look, I earned these gray hairs, you know? <laughs> well, and that's the thing it's, and that's the thing that, you know, me as, you know, somebody who has not been alive as long as you've been doing this, I don't have the grit necessarily to back up, you know, uh, I think I'm doing some cool stuff, but it's like, when you really are, a badass is when you've been doing it consistently for many years and you've stayed true to the game, you've hustled and you've, you've, it's not just a phase, right? It's a lifestyle that you've perpetuated over the course of many years. So you haven't always been so notorious, right? Because now, what do you think, Glenn? I mean, I think it's safe to say you have a pseudo celebrity status within the industry you know i would uh, you're recognized grudgingly agree it's weird okay it's weird. i'm i'm glad that you can you can admit that i know I, it's I, probably I, tough right i'm to... super uncomfortable with anybody ever saying nice things about me i don't know why i'm a, an only child i should be i should be used to being praised because that's what people think because i'm an only child i was uh, i was raised very special like, well, it goes oh. back to that childhood trauma right yeah that's, man. Uh, uh, yeah, I really, honestly, I still feel, you know, because I was, um, I was born in November and our schools, the cutoff date was December 1st for uh, the new, going into the new year. So I was one of the youngest kids in my grade, therefore much smaller than everybody else. Plus I was just never, I was born curious, but I was also born with um, bum legs and stuff like that. So I can't, I'm not as active as other people in terms of being able to do sports in the same way as everybody else is. I was bad at it. 
So it created a bad self image for myself because I would get picked last for all of those teams growing up, right? And I don't know how it was for you, Kyle, but in the 1970s and early 80s, it was difficult. It was, you are left out there to die on the vine, right? We had these physical fitness tests that the government would force you to do. And then the entire class of bullies would stand around you and they'd watch you as you would fail miserably at doing pull-ups. And then everyone would laugh at you and the gym teacher would laugh at you. And then it was very, very, um, very, very frustrating coming up in that atmosphere. So a lot of the way I see myself is, through that lens, even though I don't let my childhood traumas that we've all had, and they're all difficult on everybody, I don't let it affect me anymore, but it definitely shaped me and it's prevented me from feeling comfortable when people say nice things about me. Well, Glenn, um, I just want you to know that I connect with you on that deeply because I've been through very, very similar things myself. Um, Because as a premature baby, I had leg braces at one point literally that I had to wear on my legs. I Mm -hmm. suck at sports. I'm not athletic. Right. Um, I'm, I mean, you saw, I just had heart surgery recently. This has been going on for, for my decades that I've been alive. So, you know, I'd be in class with a bunch of wires strapped to my chest. And every time I had a heart palpitation, I had to press a button in a fanny pack that would make this loud siren noise that everybody would look at me. And this happened all the time. Dude, every you day. had my sympathy at fanny pack. <laughs> <laughs> but but Glenn, I just want to say I I vibe with you on that. Like I I I totally agree, you know, like there's been moments where my self-esteem has been into the, the dumps basically. Um, but I think there's also a certain resilience that comes from, you know, you put yourself out there, like all these people who bully you, man, or who have bullied you in the past, like granted who knows where they are now, but I'm sure that the vast majority of them are not putting themselves in a vulnerable, vulnerable position day in and day out to the entire world. Um, and you know what? Good for you. I seriously respect the hell out of you for that, for coming back. I really appreciate that Kyle, but some of it also is just, you have to, we all go through this journey in life and we all have to find a place of confidence. And, um, I turned 50 this past year. And with that, kind of frees you up, right? When you're younger, you're so worried about what other people are thinking and stuff like that. And then a little bit later on in life, you start to realize that it doesn't matter what people are thinking. And then you get to my age and you realize people don't give a shit about you at all. Anyway, they weren't thinking about you. You just tortured yourself for no good reason. Why, why bother? So now I find I could be authentically myself. And that has been something I've been working really hard on And I think once I started No Vacancy and all of that, I really allowed myself to be ultimately me. When I first started partnering with Anthony to do the the live show, and for those of you who didn't know, I was doing the No Vacancy with Glenn Hausman podcast, and I was doing checking in with Anthony and Glenn with uh, Anthony Melchiori, and I had a few other shows. And then the uh, COVID crisis hit, and I had just gotten access to LinkedIn Live, and we just started going on every day, and Anthony joined me uh, live every single day. And before you knew it, We kind of combined those two shows and it just became No Vacancy Live, which was on every day. But Anthony at first was like, dude, you got to tone it down. You got to do this. You got to do that. And I'm like, no, no, thanks. I'm like, I know you might think I'm corny or silly or whatever, but this is who I am. And I'm proud to be what I am. And either people are going to like it or not. And that's just the way it is. And then he got on board and now uh, he's getting more goofy, (laughs) which I love. (laughs) That is just, that is just awesome. You know, cause you know, I, I guess my point, right. You've never, you haven't always been the guy that people are maybe waiting in line to shake hands with at the conference because they want to meet you. You haven't always been the guy who um, has the number one podcast in hospitality um, among, among so many other accomplishments and notoriety that you have. So well, I was the guy around your age or so who would walk in to a conference cocktail party, immediately freak out, start sweating, turn around and go back to my room because I was scared. You really, really, you would, you told yourself this time is going to be different. I, I can meet, I can mingle. And then you'd go in and then it would just be like, right. All it was really with. difficult because you're entering a room of potentially hundreds and hundreds of people that don't know you. 
and you don't know the business, how are you going to get in with these people and feel good about yourself while getting them to like you? And, uh, you know, for me at that point in my life, I wasn't who you see here today. I was still scared. I was frightened like a lot of other people are when they begin their careers. And you didn't know how to, how to be yourself, right? You think that you have to be somebody to fit into this um, corporate mainstream design that we're all supposed to, uh, to have. But the reality is the farther I let myself be, uh, the farther I went away from being my authentic self, the more difficult it was for me. And at some point I made some friends, not so far into it, and they would introduce me to a person here or there. And then over the years, it started to become easier and easier. And now I'm at the point, if I know I don't know anybody in a room, I don't care because I've worked at it so long that I finally have the confidence in myself to go ahead and do things. And I don't have to worry about being validated by others. But let me tell you, man, it was really hard at the beginning just saying hello to people and then learning how to speak in public after that was probably two of the hardest challenges I've ever had, but are also two of the things I'm most proud of in my life because I took things that seemed impossible to me, wrestled them to a ground, and now I mastered them and dominate those things that made me feel bad about myself. I think um, it can be argued that that similar concept is the meaning of life in general, which is to confront the um, potential of what could be and to wrestle it to the ground and, uh, and overcome it. And what, you, what was so insurmountable for you at the beginning is now precisely what you're known for and right. what, you're right. be- what people are, you are sought after for your public speaking right. abilities. You are, again, now people are waiting in line to come up and talk to you versus you abandoning a, a room full of people. Um, yep. and, and, and that's because you persevered, you kept going and, and you overcame that. And I think that, you know, we can translate that because this people is a key essence of the hotel business and of the hospitality business. It's an essence of life. It's an essence of every business, but particularly in this space, you can't do it without the people. If you're, if you're, if you don't have the skills to confront a group of people, whether that's your team at the property level, whether that's guests um, and, you know, public speaking, you have to present in meetings, you have to motivate your team during standups. So even these, you know, there are hoteliers who are just starting out there on the property level who are like you in the past, right? And they're like, I'm scared because I can't give a stand-up meeting or I, I don't know how to confront somebody or right. about something. What's your advice for uh, for people to really overcome these sort of insecurities and self-doubt uh, that can uh, be yeah, a problem? You have to confront it and deal with it. Um, one phrase I'm seeing online all the time is you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that is, um, that is the reality of it all. And that is the way that I have tried to live my life. Figure out what makes me uncomfortable and uncomfortable things are things that I'm not naturally good at or things that I don't necessarily want to do, but realize I have to do. And then go ahead and take one thing at a time and try to deal with that particular element that I would like to correct in my life. Focus on it, focus on it, focus on it until it just becomes a normal pattern of behavior and then go ahead and take on another challenge. So like everything else I said in my career, I didn't didn't need to go from zero to 60 the fastest. I just needed to keep making continual progress. And for me, what works well with who I am as a human being is taking one thing at a time, figuring it out, demystifying it. Don't be scared of it anymore master it and then get on to another thing. And how many times have you failed trying to do that? I don't know. I'm really good in the sense that I don't dwell on my failures. I don't think about them. I, I, I still think about like, again, not being picked for that kickball team when I was in first grade. But other than that, mm-hmm. 
I don't think about the things that I failed at. They're all just stepping stones in my journey. And at some point, Kyle, I would get bogged down by, I can't believe this thing didn't happen, or I can't believe I wasn't good enough to get that job or whatever, or whatever, or whatever. But at some point, uh, I just came to the realization that the universe didn't want that for me. That just because that door closed doesn't mean there aren't bigger and brighter and more exciting things ahead. And every single time I was disappointed by something, it has fundamentally led to something much, much better that I didn't know I wanted, but was really happy when it arrived. The world is such an abundant place mm -hmm. and life is such a long process. Um, and I think what you said is so helpful to people um, because if you're confronting something that you're uncomfortable with and you are taking that one thing, working on it, demystifying it, and then moving on, the process of just confronting this one thing, even though there might be 50 other things, is going to be a process that is more than likely filled with setbacks, doors that have closed, um, opportunities that you thought that you couldn't live without if it didn't manifest itself. Um, but I think, and from my perspective as well, if you just stay laser focused on your North Star, um, right? it will, you kind of swim through that, that those murky waters and those things can just pass you in your wake. Um, and, and you'll eventually just not care anymore and you'll keep doing it. And the more you practice, the more you practice, the faster you can go and, and the more efficient you become and the more confident you become. Like, I can't even imagine like you have, I don't know who you were back then, but your transformation just seems like incredible, palpable, right. just, I mean, but again, that part of you is still there. And I think that's what makes you um, radically empathetic and helps you educate, inspire and entertain because you know hey, well, I want to include everybody because I know how it feels to be excluded. I want to make sure that this isn't out of reach for some people. Let's let's bring everybody here and make them feel welcome. Right. And, uh, you know, I always think it's so important to put out positive energy into the universe. And it's not because I want to be recognized as a wonderful person. I just believe that the more positivity that you put out there, the more it shines back on you. The more open and honest you are with people, the more open and honest they're going to be with you. The more that you take risks emotionally, the more they're going to pay off for you in the long run. But it takes confidence to be able to do that because all of that kind of stuff is really scary when it comes to the average human condition. Yeah, definitely. So I wanna, I wanna ask you a couple things uh, regarding your, your content is every single day consistent, multiple, I mean, sometimes multiple times a day, live, mm -hmm. in your face. Do you ever just wake up and you say, I don't want to fucking do this today. My gosh, I don't have the energy to be, be out here like this. Because seriously, like there's no days off for you in terms of being out there in, in you know, and it's, and it's worked for your reputation. You've achieved that, you know, celebrity status, but man, um, uh, tell tell me about that. Is that ever a thought in your mind? Uh, I would say it's never not a thought. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> every single day it gets to be a challenge. Now look at some of these YouTube people. You know the ones that get hundreds of thousands of views on every single video, and they're putting out one, two videos, six, seven days a week. I don't know how you do that. Yet I'm doing that. I'm doing um, five live shows a week. I do a radio show on Sundays. I do two No Vacancy News Today reports every week. I do custom content for people. Um, then I'm fortunate enough to get invited to do things like this from time to time. So I have to have a lot of energy and put out a lot of energy. And it can be very depleting. I had to record two videos for uh, the adapters over here because we're doing short form videos on that. I had to do two of them on a Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Sundays is usually my day to like stare into space and not talk to anybody. But I had to do that and then I have to do a radio show on Sunday night. So it kind of threw me off my schedule. But I am perpetually, perpetually physically and um, emotionally exhausted. I think a lot of it has to do from the last year, from just doing wash, rinse, repeat over and over and over again. 
but it takes a lot of it takes a lot of energy to put yourself out there and to do this every single day. Not to take away from everybody else, because everything that you guys out there are doing is equally as exhausting. At the hotel level, if you are speaking to people, you have to be on and engaged, just like I am every day. But sometimes I think how people think that what I'm doing is something special or something different just because I have this camera here. But that's not true. We're all in the same thing. We all some days have to dig very, very deep in order to build up that energy to get going. Plus, you know, coffee doesn't hurt either. Cheers to that, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I had to cut out coffee. I had to cut out coffee drinking though after like uh, eleven or twelve in the morning because uh, it just makes me too, too crazy. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I tell myself. I'm going to brew that second pot at like one, one thirty, two o'clock. Yep. And then when I'm laying in bed that night, right. tired, but That's my right. heart rate is elevated. I say, you did it again, didn't you? Yep. Not again. Why do you hate yourself? <laughs> Isn't that funny? Like how we know these things about ourselves, yet we continue to make those same stupid mistakes over and over and over again. I still do dumb stuff like that. It's ridiculous. Well, and I think like that might be one example, but another example might be you wake up or anybody, right? You wake up and you, you are right. Like you said, you're exhausted, right? And you literally have the choice every morning. Do I s turn my alarm clock off and just continue to sleep and just decay essentially, or do I get up and face the potential of the day and what could be and continue to be consistent. Um, right. And, and again, after this past year, this is something that even before this past year too, but so many people are experiencing this. What's the anecdote? Uh, because man. you wake your ass up every day. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you just have to do it. There is no choice. Sure. There's a choice, but there's really no choice. Right. I mean, it doesn't matter what I want personally. I'm at the point in my life where I've got, a, I've got a home and a mortgage I have to pay for. I've got to pay for two car leases. I've got college for twin, twin boys coming up in a year from now. I've got a lot of responsibilities, more than I've ever had in my entire life, plus trying to build this, uh, this business. So I, I can't stop. And I may actually work a little too much. And I'm trying to find that work-life balance. And I'm trying to trust others to do certain things for me. And I'm working towards that to free me up to have more of my life. Because now I'm at the point where I'm worried I'm working too hard and doing too much. And you know, again, going to that old phrase, nobody ever said on their deathbed, they wish they worked more, right? So I have to find a balance now to be able to be extremely productive while also doing better at self-care and turning things off and just having more Sundays where I could, you know, stare into space in my backyard. It's a, it's an interesting dichotomy because yes, on one hand, like nobody ever said on their deathbed, I wish I worked harder. Mm -hmm. However, what you are doing is creating a legacy and a real life impact um, for people. Um, and what you're doing is not insignificant in terms of the work. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, yes, you might be working a lot, but it's not for nothing. And I, I also think too, that imagine that you freed up a lot of this time in your life and you, rather than working 60 hour a week was now working 35 hours a week. Would you feel a little guilty? Like I'm not fulfilling my purpose. I'm not being a productive, because I think this is another thing right. to, to loop in. Like the, the, there are people who make the decision every day mm -hmm. to sleep past that alarm or to do, right. or to, to not confront. Right. But then there's a guilt that might be associated with that. Right. Like, oh my gosh, I know that I'm supposed to be doing this, but I'm not. Right. Um, so do you feel like that, is that something that you've experienced as well? Uh, or you think you would if you stopped working so much? Like, what the reason why, I, yeah, I, I'm laughing and giggling with what you're saying because it's completely my life. I always feel perpetually behind. I always feel two, three, four years behind where I arbitrarily decided I feel that I should be today based on no reality 
right? But for some reason, I always feel guilty. I haven't done enough. No matter yeah. what it is, I haven't done enough. Why didn't I just do that one thing? Why did I decide, decide this morning for 20 minutes to watch that dumb video on YouTube as opposed to actually doing something I was supposed to do, right? So every single day I'm confronted by this guilt, these feelings that I'm not good enough, I'm not working hard enough, and everyone's gonna figure out I'm a fraud really darn quick if I don't just keep pushing forward and working even harder than I am today. So those feelings are coming into direct conflict with the fact that I need to balance my life a little bit better. And I'm trying very hard to work from 7.30 in the morning to 3.30 or four o'clock, then go get some exercise and make some dinner for my family and spend some time with my family. And then maybe, you know, follow up on some emails and phone calls at the end of the uh, end of the day if I, I need to. But it's very difficult to balance all of these things. Kyle, I don't know if you have it uh, as well. It sounds like you do, but I think a large- well, How can you tell? <laughs> right, but right, a lot of us feel that way. Um, I actually think that's great. I feel sorry for the people that don't have that in them. I think that it's gonna hold them back from achieving who they could possibly be because they don't have that devil sitting on their shoulder yelling at them, telling them they're no good. I've always thought that that's helped me succeed. And some of those bullies that used to pick on me when I was a kid, when I'd go back to the high school reunions and I got over being bullied by them, I don't think that they have achieved in their lives what their potential originally had for whatever reasons that is. I don't know if it was um, their upbringing or whatever scenarios that they had in their lives, but I feel as if some of that negativity that I experienced early on has actually been beneficial to making me work harder, push me harder, and to be able to say, ha ha, look, whatever you said I couldn't do, I've now done it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I definitely think that it's it's fuel uh, to uh, achieving and, and fuel to making an impact. Because I mean, really, it's at the end of the day, it's and I can tell from from just the vibe that you have that it's not it's for you, but it's, again, you have this, this educate, inspire and entertain, um, that I think is such a cool, just like guiding principle that keeps you focused every day. Um, and to know, because the more you do it, the more you realize, oh, like somebody emailed me and said that it was a great program today, or I have this person who said that they were inspired to, you know, take this leap and do something in their lives as a result of, of what I'm doing. And then you start to think, huh, so I'm laboring away, but in my own world and in my narrow sphere of, you know, um, <laughs> self-contempt, I'm telling myself, this is only for me, I just have to keep going. But then you start to widen your perspective and you say, wow, it's actually helping others. And I think that for me personally is what makes it yeah. easier for me to keep to keep doing. Um, I mean, how cool is it to be able to get people to, to learn or excite them about something? I mean, it's such a great feeling to, to, to see the comments on the No Vacancy Live show that people are into what we're saying and that they're learning. And then more importantly, taking something that they've heard that um, we or I have done, applied it to their careers or personal lives, and then found success with that. That to me doesn't get any better. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, last question for you, Glenn. You've talked to so many leaders, you've talked to two plus decades of talking to, to uh, the highest up people in brands, management companies, legendary hoteliers. What are some of the red threads that you have found? And again, using your gift of synthesis here, what are um, like just... I guess the common denominator that you found for these um, successful hospitality people, um, what, what do you think? What are your observations? Uh, I think it all comes down to uh, the Broadway show Hamilton and the, uh, the, the lyric, I'll never be satisfied. That's uh, in one of the, uh, the songs. I mean, in that it was uh, unrequited love and all of that kind of stuff. But in this, it's really you're never satisfied with where you are. You want to be a better person tomorrow than you are today. You want to figure out what that problem is, solve it and move on. So I think people that um, inherently have that within them or are curious or have forced themselves through the sheer willpower and grit to move forward, 
That is a common theme that I have seen. Every single person I have known has had horrible, terrible, miserable failures in their lives. And you know what? Maybe they kissed, uh, they licked their wounds for a day or two or whatever it was. They got back up and they fought harder and then they finally found success. So you just got to keep pushing forward, acknowledge we're all human and try to find a way to be able to get through whatever problems you have, get comfortable being uncomfortable and find success. That is what everybody I know that didn't come from a giant, uh, giant family wealth has found success from. So uh, there are no, no shortcuts, right? That's just, you gotta, oh, you gotta be willing no to overcome. Shortcuts, dude. Listen, the way you perceive me is so different than I perceive me, right? Because you didn't know who I was until a year or so ago, right? So here you see this person that's different than you are that might have done a few things that you have yet to do, right? But I've been where you are right? I started out at zero. I started out with no relationships and no knowledge of the hotel business. But because every single day I worked at it and I pushed my ass knowing that it might not pay off for a long, 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 long time, I just kept doing it. And then eventually I was got to a point where somebody like you looks at me and goes, oh, he has it together. But I haven't had it together. I probably still don't have it together. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll have it all figured out, but it doesn't really matter because it's a matter of a journey. And again, being um, better than I was yesterday and hopefully not as good as I am tomorrow. Yeah, I, I definitely love that, Glenn. Um, thank you for your vulnerability. Um, this has been a, uh, I feel like a very intimate conversation. I've enjoyed your, uh, yeah, just your, your candor. Kyle, I'd really rather talk about all of my uh, shortcomings than have people say things that are nice about me. So this has worked out great. <laughs> Glenn, plug, plug your life away. Tell us all where we can find you. I mean, if you're listening to Hospitality MD right now, I sure as hell hope you know where you can find Glenn. Um, because if you yeah, don't, what well, are you doing? So you Glenn, tell me. us. Of course, you can find me in a van down by the river. Um, so uh, but you can't find me there. Get the adapters, uh, go to theadapters.net. This is a great book that my partner, uh, Sean Worker, and I put together over COVID. It's not only just stories of gutsy genius thinkers about how they adapt and innovate, better preparing themselves for the fourth age, you know, the post industrial age that we're in right now. It's really about grit and how people adapt and thrive. There's all sorts of formulas in there that teaches you how to be a better leader. There's links in the book to uh, video interviews. So you get really in depth with these things. Plus we're doing all sorts of original content every single week available at adapters.net. Of course, go to novacancynews.com. Follow all of our news on there. And if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube page, I don't know what to tell you. Do it now. Shame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my YouTube audience is not so great. As you know, we talked about this, but so I'm still trying to get it up, get it going, get it going. But please follow me on uh, LinkedIn if you're not on there as well. I'm finally at a good place with that and I'd like to keep it going. So thanks guys. And yes, uh, everybody, you don't have to remember all of that links. You know, if you're watching on YouTube, will be in the top of the description. If you're listening on uh, audio only podcast platforms, check the show notes for uh, Glenn's information, links, no vacancy, YouTube, all that good stuff. Um, thank you so much for those who are listening. Uh, this has been Hospitality MD, and we'll see you next week. Thank you all so much for sticking around for the whole thing. We hope you found value in today's episode. Again, if you did, be sure to drop a subscription and a like and a comment if you haven't already. Um, Glenn's information is in the description box below. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We love you. We appreciate all of your support and we will see you next week.